The scripture reading for this morning is Matthew 13, verses 44 to 45. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. And with his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is a really weird weekend for me. In high school in the late 1980s, I fell in love with Les Miserables. I wanted to play every character, particularly Enjolras and Gavroche. This show may be the major reason that I am a musician. I've been waiting for 20 years to be part of a production of it. I've seen every off-Broadway tour I could manage. I've read the book multiple times. I've listened to the score on every road trip I've ever been on. And I have dreamed and imagined what I would do with the music when, not if, I got the opportunity. So this cause has subtly shaped portions of my life, and it has come to fruition this week. And I love it, no doubt. Being part of this production has been stressful and fantastic, rewarding beyond major. It's better than my teenage aspirings ever imagined. But did you know, everybody dies. Okay, mostly everybody. Each one has a reason, a cause worth dying for, a treasure worth selling everything and buying that field. This is a far, far thing from most of our experiences, isn't it? Some of us have really fought in wars, laid our lives on the line for country or duty, but not most of us. And we certainly don't have a common experience of a light of rebellion ablaze in our eyes, as Ajaras describes the people that he hopes will rise up to conquer oppression and tyranny. Especially when it comes to our faith. We are extremely accepted and comfortable in our culture, aren't we? Several years ago, I read a book called Jesus Free, which was published by the band DC Talk and a group called Voice of the Martyrs. It's a powerful book. It contains testimony after testimony of people who found their faith in Christ to be a cause worth dying for. From Stephen, who was stoned under Paul's supervision, described in the book of Acts, to modern people willing to lay down their lives rather than deny Jesus. The work of Voice of the Martyrs continues. Now they have a website that I would urge you to visit to see the reality of life for Christians in many parts of the world. There are real life stories of people who find this treasure to be a cause worth dying for. And just as those happenings were real, the tyranny and oppression of the poor in France during the time of the June Rebellion that the novel and the musical ladies described was very real. The character of Angelos in Les Miserables has an ability that we should aspire to, to be a voice for the oppressed, a voice for the voiceless. His empathy is so high and his passion so intense that he believes he's just part of the chain, that others will build upon his life and his death and build a better world. He is building the kingdom, and his passion transforms those around him. Hugo writes about the moment of his death. Relegated as he was to a corner and as though sheltered behind the billiard table, the soldiers their eyes fixed upon the Ross, had never noticed Grantaire, his friend. And the sergeant was preparing to repeat the order, take aim, when suddenly they heard a powerful voice cry out beside them, Vive la République, count me in. Grantaire was on his feet. The immense glare of the whole combat that he had 
mist, and in which he had not been, appeared in the flashing eyes of the transfigured man. He repeated, Be not a belief, crossed the room firmly, and took his place in front of the muskets beside his friend, Angelas. Two at one shot, he said. And turning toward Angelas, he said to him, Will you permit it? Angelas shook his hand with a smile. The smile had not finished before the report was heard. Angelas, pierced by eight bullets, remained back up against the wall as if the bullets had nailed him down. His friend struck him, collapsed at his feet. Grandpierre was transformed by Angelas' intense passion. And like him, a young boy who joins the revolutionaries, Gavroche, is also transformed. And his death is met without fear, without personal despair. Hugo writes, Gavroche had fallen only to rise again. He sat up, a long stream of blood rolled down his face. He raised both arms in the air, looked in the direction from which the shock had come, and began to sing. These men had a cause, and a faith in that cause worth dying for. They are heroes. But in this book, with so much death, Hugo sees in them a noble passion but they and their deaths are not lifted as high as the other characters in the story. There's another who sacrifices her life for a cause. But hers is a moment of sacrifice for the man that she has loved in silence. Ebony takes a bullet for Marius as he battles on the barricade. She lives out Jesus' statement that greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for one's friend in John 15. She says, promise to give me a kiss on my brow when I am dead, and I shall feel it. All at once, at the very moment when Marius fancied her asleep forever, she slowly opened her eyes, in which appeared the somber profundity of death and said to him in a tone whose sweetness seemed all ready to proceed from another world, I believe I was a little bit in love with you. This sacrificial, beautiful, noble death leaves us in tears. Even if we have not experienced oppression or this level of loving self-sacrifice, we'd like to see ourselves in Gavroche and in Angelos, in Grand Hair and in Ebony. There's another death in this story that perhaps we don't want to see ourselves in, even though we have to look at it. This is an uncomfortable death. This is the death of the inspector Javert. Javert has lived his whole life working for God. Like Luther, before his study and experience of grace, Javert can only see the stain of sin. He has spent a lifetime disciplining himself, relentlessly pursuing wrongdoers in order to bring them to justice. He understands that to God all sins look the same, and he is as passionate about pursuing Jean Valjean, whose crime was the theft of a loaf of bread, as he is about spying on the revolutionaries, who he sees as committing murderous crimes against God's chosen leaders. To him, any crime is a window into the state of a hellbound soul. And to Javert, anyone who has committed any crime is only capable of evil. He has missed that to God every sin looks the same, and every sin is worthy of grace. When Jean Valjean, whom he has pursued his whole life in order to jail him again, 
has an opportunity to execute Javert as a spy. He responds with mercy and grace. Valjean's mercy twists of Javert's head. He cannot comprehend it. And the idea that Valjean, and therefore God, could be merciful and transform someone through love and grace instead of simply destroying them through punishment is much more than Javert can accept. Hugo writes of Javert in his crisis, before him he saw two roads, both equally straight, but he did see two, and that terrified him. He who had never in his life known anything but one straight line. And, bitter anguish, these roads were contradictory. His spiritual anguish is bitter. And instead of reaching out to a God that he can no longer comprehend, a God that he has discovered is not contained by the box that he's put in it. Instead of taking the opportunity to change and to grow and to find a larger reality of the kingdom of God, Javert takes his own life. There's only one death left in our story. And that's the death of Jean Valjean. Yes, at the end of the play, he passes from life into life everlasting. But I believe that he has died in a much more true way earlier in this story. <laughs> the day he chooses to die to self in order to let Christ's life overtake him. This is a man for whom living is Christ and dying is gain. Jean Valjean has found the true cause worth dying for. And that is a life in Jesus Christ. The bishop, who is the hand of God in Valjean's life, asks him, Are you afraid of the good you might do? And I ask you the same question. What if? I uncomfortably ask myself the truth question, especially since dying to self is something I'm really good at failing at. In many, if not all ways, the conscious choice to lay down our life, not for a cause or for a person that we love, is difficult. It's more difficult. It's an uncomfortable admission that we are not perfect. We are not righteous. We are incapable of true love, kindness, grace, or mercy without laying our lives down at the foot of the cross and letting Christ live instead in us. But what if we lay aside our fear of losing everything that we cling to? What if we sold everything we had in order to buy that field with the treasure in it? What if you and I were so passionately committed to the cause of Christ that nothing could stop us from living as he intends to. The bishop in Les Miserables is committed. He is so committed that he lets Valjean, a desperate convict, into his house. How many of us would let a convict on the run into our house for the night? I'm not raising my hand. But the bishop says this. We pray together. We are afraid together. And then we go to sleep. Even if Satan came into this house, no one would interfere. After all, what is there to fear in this house? There is always one with us who is the strongest. Satan may visit our house, but the good Lord lives here. The bishop does not show Valjean anything but love, telling him that love is the only future that God offers. Valjean is transformed by his experience of Christ and the death of his old self into a life in Jesus. 
When this happens to him, Hugo says, he did not study God. He was dazzled by him. Are you dazzled by Jesus Christ? Are you so passionately in love with him that he is a cause worth dying for? If your answer is no, or not yet, or not anymore, it's time to die. It's time to let his life overtake you. It's time to be so overwhelmed by his love, his mercy, and his abundant life that your death is nothing and his grace pours out of you. As Hugo writes at the end of the novel, it is nothing to die. It is frightful not to live. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. I invite you to rise and share God's peace with you.